Welcome ladies and gentlemen to lecture number five. Today we're going to focus on three areas, human resource management, trade unions and health management information systems. My name is Stanley and I'll take you through these three sections. Uh, I'll start with uh, human resource management. Unfortunately, I've had to write with my hand on a paper and take this picture. So I hope you'll be able to see, but I'll try to read the questions before I give answers to the same. Uh, question one on human resource management. 1A. Define recruitment. Define recruitment. Uh, the definition for recruitment is recruitment refers to the overall process of attracting, shortlisting, selecting, and appointing suitable candidates for jobs in brackets either permanent or temporary close brackets within an organization. Recruitment refers to the overall process of attracting, comma, shortlisting, comma, selecting and appointing suitable candidates for jobs, either permanent or temporarily within an organization. So the process that we go about in getting the best candidate, that is attracting them by advertising, shortlisting them, calling them for interviews, selecting them, that is interviewing them, and appointing them, giving them the job uh, for suitable jobs. This can be either permanent or temporary within an organization. So that is the definition for recruitment. Part 1B, outline any five objectives of a human resource management. Outline any five objectives of human resource management. The first objective is effective utilization of resources. Effective utilization of resources. So this is one of the objectives of human resource uh, management, where we are saying when we have the people, which is the human resource, the resource which is human, people, individuals in an organization, Effective utilization of this human resource is the first objective of human resource management. The second objective is organizational structure. Human resource management is responsible for establishing the organizational structure. That is developing the organogram, the flow chart in terms of who is who in terms of positions in the organization. Number three. The development of human resources. When we have people employed in an organization, these individuals, they also need to be developed. Some of them, they need to be sent for further training or to be sent for specialized training. It is the responsibility of the human resource management to develop these human resources. Number four, employee satisfaction. It is the objective of human resource management to ensure that employees are satisfied. So the Human Resource Management Department, it plays a critical role in doing some surveys, that is employee satisfaction surveys, as well as coming up with strategies which can be used by the organization in motivating employees. So it is the overall responsibility of Human Resource Management to ensure that employees are satisfied. Then we have employee discipline and morale. It is the re responsibility of human resource management to discipline employees, to lead the disciplinary process whenever an employee has performed or has done something which is out of line of what they are expected of doing. So it is the responsibility of human resource management to have employee discipline as well as keeping morale in the organization. The other objective is organizational productivity. It is the responsibility of human resource management to ensure that organizational productivity is on a high end, meaning to say they need to make sure that all the people involved in the organization, they are performing or they are working to the maximum potential so that uh, they can are maximized on organizational productivity. And the last one is goal harmony. It is the objective of human resource management to make sure that there is harmony in attainment of 
the overall goals of the organization. I'll go through the five objectives of human resource management, but here I've mentioned more than five. I've mentioned about seven. So the first one is effective utilization of resources. Two, organizational structure. Three, development of a human resource. Four, employee satisfaction. Five, employee discipline and morale. Six, organizational productivity. And seven, goal harmony. These were the expected answers for part B. Then we move on to part C. Discuss the seven functions of human resource management. Discuss the seven functions of human resource management. We need to be very careful with this question because the functions and objectives, these are two different things. So the seven functions of human resource management are number one, strategic management. Number two, workforce planning and employment. Workforce planning and employment. This includes recruitment and selection. Number three, human resource development. Human resource development. This includes training and development. Number four, total rewards. Number four, total rewards. This includes compensation and benefits. Number five, policy formulation. Number five, policy formulation. Number six, employee and labor relations. Number six, employee and labor relations. And number seven, risk management. Number seven, risk management. So these are the seven functions of human resource management. Then we move on to part D. Discuss any five factors that will demotivate the newly employed nurses. Discuss any five factors with, that will demotivate the newly employed nurses. It is a fact that when you finish your training, you're going to be employed as nurses. But there are also some other factors that new nurses were employed, they also face, which normally demotivate them. And when they're demotivated, it means that they're not going to contribute fully the, all the potential they have to the organization, be it at the hospital, be it at the clinic, or be it in the Ministry of Health. So the five factors that we have is number one, lack of flexibility. Lack of flexibility can demote annually employed nurses. It is important for us to remember that when someone is new, sometimes they also need time to adjust, to settle in, and the flexibility sometimes can be important for these newly employed nurses. So lack of flexibility is the first factor. The second factor is short-term objectives with no career vision. If the newly employed nurse discovers that the objectives are short-term and there is no career progression, they are more likely to become demotivated. What it means is when a nurse gets into the new job, they need to understand how they are going to advance their career. Are there opportunities for them to specialize and become critical care nurses? Are there opportunities for them to specialize and become theater nurses? Are there opportunities for them to specialize and become uh, midwives. So when the career vision is not there, they can become demotivated. Number three, feeling undervalued. Feeling undervalued can demotivate the newly employed nurses. It is common knowledge that everyone wants to be valued. So in an, a new employee, in a new organ, in an organization where a new employee is not, whenever they feel undervalued, they are more likely to become demotivated. Number four, lack of developmental opportunities. Everyone wants to progress, as I said earlier on. So lack of developmental opportunities can also demotivate the newly employed nurses. Poor leadership. Poor leadership can also demotivate newly employed nurses. Leadership plays a very big role in motivating employees. So leadership can play a huge role in demotivating newly employed nurses. Then the next one we have is conflict. Conflict in its own actually uses a lot of energy. It uses, it takes time and it is one area that can also demotivate newly employed nurses. So imagine a new nurse has come to the workplace and 
they are in conflict with the colleagues, they are in conflict with the management, they will feel demotivated and they are not going to do their best in doing their work. So conflict is another factor that can demotivate the newly employed nurses. Then we have what we call unrealistic workload. All newly employed nurses, they actually need to have a workload which is reasonable. So if we are to give them unrealistic workload, that can also demotivate these newly employed nurses. So here they wanted five and I've actually put seven factors. So I'll just run through the seven factors so that we internalize them. The first one is lack of flexibility. Second one is short-term objectives with no career vision. The third one is feeling undervalued. Fourth one is lack of developmental opportunities. Sixth one is poor leadership followed by conflict and unrealistic workload. So these were the expected responses for the question on human resource management. So we move on to the other question, which is on trade unions. Question one, define the following. One, trade union, and two, industrial relations. Now, a trade union is an organized association of workers in a trade, group, or a profession formed to protect and further their rights and interests. I will repeat, trade union is an organized association of workers in a trade, group, or a profession formed to protect and further their rights and interest. What does this mean? It means that us as nurses, we also have our own association. Zambian, uh, we've got a Zambian Nurses Union, if I remember very well. We also have what is called uh, Zambia Congress of Trade Union. So these are groups of people who come together. So these people, they can come together as people who are in a specific trade or profession. For example, nurses, they come together, they form their own trade union. Teachers, they come together, they form their own union. Uh, miners, they come together, they form their own union. So all these people, they group together so that they can protect and further their rights and interests. So a group of nurses, they will stand for the rights of nurses as well as advance the, nurses, the interest of nurses. The same applies for teachers, the same applies for minors. So that is what we have, what is called a trade union. I will define it again. Trade union is an organized association of workers in a trade or group or a profession which is formed to protect and further their rights and interests. The second part is define industrial relations. Industrial relations, this is the relationship between management and workers in industry and the political decisions and laws that affect it. I will repeat the definition. This is the relationship between management and workers in industry and the political decisions and laws that affect it. I'm not going to detail to explain this part. I think it is self-explanatory. Then we move on to question B. Discuss any four types of trade unions. Discuss any four types of trade unions. Here I've actually given you five and I'll try to explain after mentioning uh, the unions. The first one we have what is called the general union. The general union. Now from the word general, this is a union that encompasses people from different uh, professions and skills. So a general union in brackets for skilled and unskilled workers performing different jobs in different industries. For example, bank tellers, cleaners, nurses, and teachers. So we have different trade unions coming together to form one big union, which is called a general union. A very good example is the Zambia Congress of, Zambia Congress of Trade Union, ZCTU. It is formed by different skilled and unskilled workers. 
So different associations, they come to form Zambia Congress of Trade Union. We have the nurses there, we have the teachers there, we have the miners there, we have the bankers there. So we've got different trade unions which have come together to work as one in a general union. Number two, we have what is called an industrial union. An industrial union in brackets, these seek to represent all workers in a particular industry. For instance, those in railways or energy sector. So we have people who work in a similar industry coming together to form a union. So it represents people who are in that specific industry. For example, people who work in the energy sector. We have got Zesco, which is an energy sector. We also have Cooper Belt Energy, which is an energy sector. So we have employees who work in the energy sector coming together so that their interests are represented as one. The third one, we have what is called craft unions. Craft unions. In the brackets, these represent workers with particular skills. For example, plumbers, weavers, and may be employed in a number of industries. So what we have is these are people with specific skills. For example, I am a plumber or you are a weaver. So even I am a plumber working for Lusaka City Council and another plumber works for Livingston City Council. Another plumber works for another mine. Just because they are all plumbers, they come together and make a union, a craft union, because they've got a certain craft that they're involved in. So they can make a union based on those specific skills that they have, which is different from an industrial union where even if someone is a plumber or is an electrician, as long as they work in the energy sector, they will be in one sector because they work in a certain just in a certain industry or company. So it is a bit different from a craft union. Craft, you are looking at specific skills. The fourth one is white collar unions. White collar unions, uh, these represent particular professions including teachers, pilots, and bank tailors. So we have what are called blue collar jobs and white collar jobs. So we have those unions for people who work in different white collar sectors. When they come together, they can form their unions. So these are the four examples that I have. I'll go through them again. We have the general union, we have the industrial union, we have the craft unions and we have the white collar unions and the respective explanations they are as i said earlier on when i was introducing each and every one of it then we move on to part c state any five roles of trade unions what are the roles of these trade unions here they wanted five but here i've got six of them so i'm just going to state these roles. Number one, they negotiate wages and working condition terms. They negotiate wages and working conditions terms. Number two, they regulate relations between workers and the employer. They regulate relations between workers and the employer. Number three, they take collective action to enforce the terms of collective bargaining. They take action, they take collective action to enforce the, the terms of the collective bargaining. Number four, they raise new demands on behalf of its members. Number four, they raise new demands on behalf of its members. Number five, they protect workers against victimization and injustice. Number five, they protect workers against victimization and injustice. Number six, they protect women against discrimination. Number six, they protect women against discrimination. So these are the roles that trade unions play. I move on to part D. Discuss the steps involved. Discuss the steps involved in disciplinary procedure. Discuss the steps involved in disciplinary procedure. The first one, number one, deciding whether formal action is necessary to solve or to solve it informally. So the first step 
a person has to decide, the manager has to decide whether is it necessary to take formal action or not to take formal action. For example, someone does something in the world, they've given a wrong drug. When you want to discipline this nurse who has given a wrong drug, there are two things we can do. Either we can make them to write a report and charge them formally, we put it under paper. Or we can informally solve it and ask why the nurse gave the wrong drug and tell them the next time you do the same thing, you're going to write a report. So when you tell them that the next time you're going to write a report, you have solved this issue informally. Whereas when you have taken formal action, you make them write the report and you take them under disciplinary procedures where you charge them. So that is the first thing that we do, the steps in disciplinary procedure. So if we decide to say, well, we need to take formal action, we move to step number two, which is commencing a disciplinary process. Now, step number two of commencing a disciplinary process, planning is very key. This is where you as a manager, first you need to check the disciplinary policy. What does the policy say if someone does something wrong? What does the nursing uh, policy say if someone gives a wrong drug? And then when you have actually looked at the policy document, then you have to identify the appropriate investigator. This is somebody who can look into the issue very closely and objectively, as well as someone who is able to keep to time scales. So that is step number two. When step number two is done, we move to step number three. This is whereby this person, this investigator, who has actually investigated the issue, they may recommend suspension. They may recommend that, ah, no, there's an issue which is here, and I think this nurse should be suspended for now. So the third stage can be suspension. This suspension can be followed by in writing, and it should not be long. And in a suspension, benefits may be given or may not be given. So step number three in the disciplinary procedure, we have suspension if the issue is very serious. But if the issue is not very serious, no suspension is done. Step number four is investigation. Sometimes it is difficult to investigate if the same person who is accused is still at work. So after they have been suspended, a full investigation is done. So investigation is stage number four. Stage number five, information to be given to the employee before the disciplinary hearing. So after we have done our investigation, let's say this employee is suspended, is at home. As a manager, you are supposed to write all the information before the disciplinary hearing, which talks about the problem or the crime or the issue that they are being charged for, uh, the investigation and the findings which have been done so that they can prepare to come and defend themselves. And then we have step number five, what we call statutory right to be accompanied, where you tell an employee, to say they can come for the hearing in the company of a fellow worker or someone from the trade union or someone or a lawyer itself. So that is step number six, where you tell the employee to bring anyone to represent them so that there is a fair disciplinary procedure taking place. Then after that, we move to another part that is involved, that is record keeping. It is important that during the process of disciplinary procedure, we have recordings being done where the secretary is taking minutes and also the one representing the worker can also take minutes. Then after a disciplinary procedure is done, a decision has to be made. So decision making is another stage which is involved in disciplinary procedure. And after a decision is done, there is need for communication of the decision to the affected employee. So after the hearing is done, the employee go home, goes home, and then the people who are involved in the disciplinary management, they will make a decision. Should we uh, put charges against this person or should we drop the charges? If the charges are to remain, we communicate, we send letters, we phone the employee and tell them, now you have been found guilty of giving a wrong drug. 
and you are going to be struck off from the register or you are going to be uh, suspended or you have to go for retraining. If the employee is not happy, the last step of the disciplinary procedure is the same employee can make what is called an appeal. So an appeal is the last stage in the disciplinary procedure. So I'm now going to read, go through all the steps I was describing. The first stage is decide whether formal action is necessary to solve the problem or to solve it informally. Number two, commencing a disciplinary process. In this key planning is key where we check disciplinary policy in choosing an appropriate investigator as well as keeping to timelines. Number three, suspension can be instituted which is followed by in writing and should not be long and benefits may be given or not number four investigation is done in full number five information is given to the employee before the disciplinary hearing about the issue that they are being charged against number six the employee is reminded of the statutory right to be accompanied by a fellow worker, a trade union member, or a lawyer. And number seven, record keeping is done during the process of disciplinary procedure. And number eight, the decision is done whether the employee is guilty or not. And number nine, the decision on the decision, the decision itself is going to be communicated to the employee and number 10, if the employee is not happy with the decision, the employee may appeal. So these are the 10 steps which are involved in the disciplinary procedure. Then we move on to the last part, health management information systems. Health management information systems. Now, uh, in health management information systems, the first part is define health information management systems. Define health information management systems. This is an information system consisting of computer, or let me give you a simple definition. Health, man health information management system is a system designed to manage healthcare data. It is a system designed to manage healthcare data. This includes systems that collect, systems that store, systems that manage and transmit a patient's electronic record, a hospital's operational management, or a system supporting healthcare policy decision. I will repeat the definition. Health information management system is a system designed to manage healthcare data. This system includes this includes systems that collect, comma, store, comma, manage and transmit a patient's electronic record, comma, a hospital's operational management, or a system supporting healthcare policy decision. So this is the definition for health management information system. We move on to part B. Now on part B, outline four types of health information managed under health management information system. Now before I move to this part, we need to understand on the definition. When we talk about health, man health information management system, we are saying we are collecting information which is related to health. We are any information related to health. For example, when you record the temperature and you write it on the patient's chart, that is part of the health management information system, and that information is stored. Okay. When we take the statistics of pregnant women uh, who are coming to register for antenatal visits, that is part of health management information system. When you transmit that information from a health center to a district, it is part of the health management information systems. When you keep that information in computers, it is part of health management information systems. So basically that is what it is in general, just for us to understand. Now we move on to part B. Outline four types of health information managed under health management information system. 
The first one is operational and tactical systems for easy classification of information. So in health management information system, we have operational and tactical systems for easy classification of information. What does it mean? It means, for example, we've got an operation uh, taking place uh, in a province. And this operation and tactical system is about reducing maternal mortality. For example, there's what is called the EMOC. EMOC is more like a system that we use to try and reduce uh, maternal mortality rates. So it becomes a management information system where we want to try and manage how we do our operations, how we do our tactics in terms of lowering maternal mortality. So it can become part of the health management information system because we are going to collect information about mothers coming for registration and antenatal visits. We are going to record information about the outcomes, how many patients were at cesarean sections done and so forth. So operational and tactical systems can make part of can be a type of health information which is managed under health management information systems. Then we have number two, which is called the clinical and administrative systems for managing patient's details on an administrative level. What does this mean? We have systems which capture the clinical information. These are the doctor's notes that we have. Okay? These are the doctor's notes that we have. These are, for example, we are also looking at the administrative systems. Yes, we have collected these patients are records and we need to manage these details the patient details on an administrative level this is where for example we now have what is called the smart care where if a patient goes to any health facility they are given a card and their information about their visits and their management if they are on ART uh, their information about which treatment they are getting what are the drugs any side effects or any history about their treatment is captured on that card so if someone is going, for example, you are in Lusaka and you go to Livingstone, you just need to carry that smart card. When you don't feel well, you go to the hospital, you are going to present that card. When they enter that card in the system, they are going to see all the information which is captured in Lusaka and there will be continued uh, management of this patient's condition. So clinical and administrative systems for managing patient details is the second uh, type of the health information which is managed under health management information system. Then we have the third one, which is called the subject and the task-based systems. Subject and task-based systems, such as the electronic medical records or electronic health records. What does this mean? It means, let's say we are here. When you go to a hospital, they, you, you have to collect your file from records so that you can be attended. So actually, we can actually have a subject and a task-based system where we can actually track and retrieve these files. So these files, they can be physical files or they can be electronic records that doctors can share among themselves in trying to help this patient. So that's another type of health information which is managed under health management information systems. Then we have what is called the financial systems for tracking revenue and managing bills submissions. We now have what is called the national health insurance scheme you find that whenever you visit a hospital, you're going to enter your details if you're on that scheme. That scheme, it will also keep track of who has been treated. And if you have been treated under that insurance, it means that the hospital has to claim money from the insurance. So we have a financial system for tracking revenue and managing billing submission. It also includes those systems which are found in hospitals and clinics where when we pay for uh, health care, you pay for x-ray, you pay for CT scan, all those financial records, they need to be recorded and tracked. So we can also have that type of health information managed under health management information system. So I've looked at the four operational and tactical systems for easy classification of information. Number two, clinical and administrative systems for managing patient details on an administrative level. Three, subject and task-based systems such as electronic medical records or electronic health records. Four, financial systems for tracking revenue and managing billing submission. We move on to part C. Describe six principles of health information management. Describe six principles of health information management. Here they want six, and uh, 
actually I put eight. The first one is accountability. The second one is transparency. The third one is integrity, protection, compliance, availability, retention, and disposition. What does it mean? When you talk about the principle of accountability, what it means is everybody should be account accountable of the information that they input in the health management information system. If you are as a nurse, you are told whatever is not documented is not done and neither should you document what was not done. So if every person is accountable for all the information that they are going to input into this health management information system. So accountability is the first principle. The second principle is transparency. In transparency, what we are simply saying is, for example, we're talking about finances and, and, and billing. We need transparency in the management so that there is no corruption in any of the systems which are involved in the health management information system. Then we have integrity. It's a very, very important principle where people, they stand for the truth and everything that they do is with truth. So integrity is important so that it actually gives confidence in the system itself. Protection. It is important that patients' information is protected. So whenever we have the health management information system being established, protection and security is important. Where we are saying if information is on the computer, does this computer have any antivirus? Does this computer have any password? So protection is very, very important principle in health information management. Then compliance. It is important that people comply with the regulatory authorities. They comply with the requirements of the job. They comply with what the ministry wants in terms of the health information management systems. So compliance is another critical principle to be followed. Availability. We are saying this health management information system should be available. It does not make sense having a health information management system which is not available to everyone. So availability is another principle which is also important in health information management systems. Then retention is also disposition. Where we are saying, yes, we've had records, but we cannot keep records forever. At what time are we going to dispose all these records that we have? So disposition is also a principle which is important in health management information system. Part D, explain the problems encountered in the implementation of the health management information system. In this system, we can also face some challenges. And the problems that we are going to have, I'm going to list them. The first one is wrong data entry. If you put wrong data, it means you're going to have a problem in health management information system. So wrong data entry is a problem which is encountered. The second problem is poor data analysis. Poor data analysis is a second problem which is encountered in the implementation of health management information system. The third one is poor power supply outages, hence need for backup systems. We've got load shedding taking place. So sometimes it is very challenging for there to be constant electricity. So what does it mean? It means for us to keep our health management information systems intact, we need to have backup systems, which can be expensive as it requires money. The fourth one is it's costly to set up. Here there is involvement of computers and servers. They are very expensive to procure. So the cost of setting up can be a problem which can be encountered in implementation of health management information system. Then we also have what is called costly to maintain. Whenever we buy any equipment, computers, laptops or servers, they need to be serviced, they need to be maintained. So they are also costly to maintain. And lastly, we have what's called the need for high capacity servers. What are these servers? Servers, it's like a hard drive. It's like something which contains the memory. So when we enter patient's details, we need high, high servers, that, servers that can actually uh, keep a lot of information. So I'm going to summarize these six, uh, these problems which are encountered just in a moment. So as I was... Um saying we said the problems which are encountered in the implementation of health management information system i understand i was a bit moving a bit fast earlier on so i'll try to summarize a bit slowly so the number one i said wrong data entry it can be a challenge because if wrong data is used 
it means we are going to make decisions using wrong data. So if we use wrong data for decision making, it means we are going to have wrong solutions. So this can be a challenge that we can face. The other one is poor data analysis, where we are saying, yes, we can have all the data available to us, but if we cannot analyze this data very well, it means we can actually have problems in implementing health management information systems because poor data analysis will result in poor decision making. Then the other one we said there is poor power supply or power supply outages, hence the need for backup systems. Because of the load shadings that we have, you find that sometimes we have our systems right, turning off and patients when they come, we cannot use their smart care cards because there is no power to power these uh, laptops or these computers. So there is need for backup systems in terms of solar or, gener or generate generator sets. So this can also be a challenge in implementing the health management information systems. And also we said it's costly to set up. It is very expensive to buy all these systems. You need internet, you need computers, you need servers, you need printers. So it is quite costly to set up and this can be a problem in the implementation of health management information systems. Also, you need to maintain these systems. You find that you need technicians, you need people who have done IT to be on site. And unfortunately, you find that here in Zambia, we don't have so many people who are so skilled in that area. So maintaining can be quite costly as we might end up having to take people from outside the country to come and repair and maintain these systems. Then the last one, we said there is need for high capacity savers. Now savers, these are more like we use them for the storage of information. And looking at uh, the quality of information which is involved in health management information system, they require a lot of space. So it can be quite expensive to actually have high capacity servers. Therefore, this can be a challenge in the implementation of health management information systems. So ladies and gentlemen, this uh, comes to the end of the three areas that I wanted to look at. Uh, human resource management, trade unions, and the health management information systems. I encourage you to read widely, uh, add on to what I've just been explaining. And for those who are not yet part of this series, I encourage you to tell them to join. As we are now focusing on specific topics, which I will try to go in detail to explain. So... There will be another video coming out soon, maybe in a day or two. If there are any questions and queries, please feel free to contact us in the respective groups for the specific lectures that we have. I'll be very glad to assist you all to make sure that you clear this nursing leadership and management module. And also, if you have any other past papers that we have not yet done or you've got some specific or structured questions on specific subjects, I really encourage you to post them through so that I look at them and I do justice to them so that we all do well and clear this course. Thank you very much for your time. I wish you well in your studies as well as, as you prepare for your finals. God bless. Stanley is my name. Bye-bye.